Good Monday evening to you, everybody. Welcome to Charting with Dan and Lon. People say we should change the name, Lon. Oh, Charting really? with Dan and Lon. Well, because it used to be kind of a rotating, right. uh, but then I've just lassoed you into doing it. I've every staked week my claim on the co the co host channel. Yes. Well, I guess now it's it's for now it's Charting. It's like this night show with Johnny Carson, though. I mean, it, it, there's an implied I'm happy dynamic. To, I'm happy to be Ed to your Johnny, <laughs> but it's also uh, you do all the work. Like I kind of sit here and riff on it with you. Yeah, but well, you've done fine. all the prep. Well, regardless. Uh, it is Just Monday so afternoon. Guys know. Exactly. <laughs> There's a little sneak behind, sneak behind, behind the, the curtain yeah. here. Uh, we are talking about everything that happened at the box office last weekend, both here in North America and worldwide, internationally. We're going to talk about uh, The Call of the Wild mm. uh, and its numbers and how it stacks up against what it costs <laughs> to make, which is uh, a lot, a shocking amount. <laughs> and then we're also going to talk about, you know, it, it's, it is the first release, Call of the Wild, under for 20th Century Studios, right, formerly yes. Fox, but it is also a legacy project that was inherited and uh the track record on those hasn't been so good one no. so we're going to break down the films that uh, were inherited by disney when they acquired fox their track record and a reason maybe for why they may not may not all be performing so well as well as looking at uh, the potential release of new mutants and mm. so many other things but first let's look at the top five for the weekend here in north america as expected uh, although it was a close call sonic the hedgehog remains number one eked out a win over a uh, call of the wild which opened this past weekend 26.1 million dollars that's a 55% drop in week two, which is uh, which it's that's about a standard drop off for a high opening blockbuster. A little bit steeper than you might see a lot of times for a kids movie. So I think that indicates perhaps that Sonic's uh, legs may be a little bit uh, I know <laughs> maybe geared a little bit more <laughs> toward uh, your average blockbuster and, and might not run out quite as long as an animated film, uh, particularly when aimed at, at kids. Regardless, uh, still. Uh, very pleased, I'm sure, Paramount sure. is with that film's performance. Uh, let's talk about Call of the Wild. Debuts at Let's. number two, $25 million. Now, in and of itself, that's not a bad number. No. The problem is <laughs> that it cost reportedly around $125 million to make, which right. is crazy. I mean, you just have to think to yourself, like, okay, so with marketing, you're talking about close to $200 million. Yeah. I mean, we all know if you watch the show regularly, like it's probably not gonna get there. That would be a very high watermark. Very high for an adventure movie starring Harrison Ford off of a book that is a classic uh, novel. Uh, many other uh, adaptations have been made of it. Opening in middle of February, up against so solid competition. Like, well, we'll talk about that part in a minute. But like, even at your greatest level of success, you're probably not gonna get to the point that makes this worth spending that much money. We were just discussing because obviously a lot of the expense came from the cartoon dog. Yes, yes. The CGI dog. They made a decision to have a full CGI dog. <laughs> As we discussed last week, Harrison Ford had to roll around, had to roll around. with a man wearing a lot of sensors. There was money scratching. involved, apparently. Uh, but we were just saying that the idea of, you know, they paid probably $750,000 for a shot of Harrison Ford petting a dog when they could have just had him pet a dog I mean, for, you could come to I my would apartment. imagine, a nominally less <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, amount of money. Taco was free. He yeah. would have come hung out and let, let Harrison Ford <laughs> pet him. Yeah, it's the, the crazy thing is when you see, the, when I saw the trailer for this, immediately I thought of all of the classic 80s and 90s Disney adventure films. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, this was developed under Fox. Now it's Disney. But it, it's reminiscent of stuff like White Fang. Like, they used to yes. make these kinds of movies all the time. And they were successful. They were mid-budget. You'd bring them out, you know, and there was an audience for them. And even if they found an audience later on home video or whatever, like you, you would you wouldn't spend so much that it was impossible to recoup what you spent. It just seems like we've entered this new mode where these budgets just skyrocket. Well, it's this thing of, uh, you know, you, we obviously don't want to return to a Milo and Otis world. No, don't look up. My Lord, <laughs> you will not be pleased. Uh, but at the it's same, it's another talking animal. Yes, you know. uh, but you don't want to put animals in peril. Uh, of course not. So when you have those digital, uh, that ability digitally to to make an animal, so that you don't have to put right. an animal in peril, that's great. And I think everybody understands. Like if it's a scene where the dog has to jump over a river or sure. something, yes, put a cartoon dog in there. Nobody's arguing that point. But I think the I think the question then would be, why? when it just says to sit there, are you paying to 
to animate a dog. Yeah, the, the clip that went viral this weekend is literally just a dog on a porch greets him. Yeah. And that you could you could use a dog for I that. mean, like, I know that Harrison Ford has a reputation for being a little prickly, but I, <laughs> I, think I don't he, think it was any danger to have the dog I, near him. He probably in proximity likes to dogs. Him. I, I'm, I'm he sure. strikes me as the kind of guy that only likes dogs. Yeah, probably, more than people. Much more than people. Yeah. Uh, I just, right, and, that, and that's the sort of thing that a train, like, we were sort of saying this before the show, when this technology was newer, it wasn't motion capture, whatever, it was just the ability to CG animate things and put them in movies. Yes. It was used as a cost-saving thing, like, oh, well, we don't have to get a trained dog to do this crazy thing that could take us months to teach it, we can just animate a dog doing that. But it's become this weird mirror image of that now, where now the computer effects are bloating these budgets beyond what they would have cost to make this same movie in the 90s. Well, I was reading a, an interesting article, and, a, and I apologize, I don't I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was talking about the mid-budget, uh, these, these mid-budget films that just have their budgets exploded. Uh, and they cited this film called The Wild and The Irishman as two films right. that uh, 10 years ago would have probably cost about $50 million to make or 60. Yeah, and Call of the Wild take... costs 60 to make and it opens to 25. Great. Yeah, you're, you're if it uh... costs 80 to make and it opens to 25, you're still not in bad shape. Uh, but this idea of because of these digital effects now and directors and producers or whomever wanting to push the envelope, you're taking these movies that cost in the past 50, 60 million dollars, and they now cost 125, 150, 175, 200. Yeah. I was reading today that they were saying that Scorsese is thinking about moving his next movie to Netflix because apparently the budget is approaching 200 million dollars. That's what, I mean, that's what they said Irishman, it eventually ended up in the 150 to 200 million range. And like, that's a movie where a bunch of guys sit around in yes. the PJs and have conversations. Exactly. I loved it. I'm not knocking the Irishman. It's great. But, like, that shouldn't cost that much. It's, the, there's no real... There are some wonderful makeup artists working in yeah. this town. And, and we would accept... Like, and uh, honestly, the Irishman, too, is a case where you could just, like, John Bernthal as young Robert De Niro go. Or like, so, yeah. we're all done. But it's this idea of, like, now that we have all these capabilities, it's exploding the budgets on these movies that maybe wouldn't cost a lot to make. Now, we don't know what the return is on the Irishman because, A, it's a Netflix movie. B, even though it played in theaters, Netflix won't say how much it made. And C, that apparently doesn't matter. They, yeah, they so, have their own cost-benefit uh, analysis yes. for what was that those Oscar nominations worth for them or whatever. Uh, but, yes, so Call of the Wild, a very expensive movie that uh, almost prohibitively expensive that yeah, they're, we'll they're, see how it does. And, and again, we talked last week about circumstance and how movies can find themselves in circumstances that they don't necessarily count on that can work for for good or ill uh, in their nature. And we'll talk about this when we get to the worldwide thing, but the idea of worldwide money bailing this movie out now may be seriously uh, in jeopardy. But let's go, we'll go to that Looking in a minute. Let's go through the rest of the top five. Uh, Birds of Prey. Now this is the drop off to keep an eye on, and this is the one that I think really does start to cement the picture for Birds of Prey, and it's not that rosy. Birds of Prey in its third week dropped 60%. That is the sort of big drop off in the third week. You know, last week we talked about the fact that it had a pretty st standard drop off. In week three, four, five, if, if they hang around, you're going to see drops more around 40, 45%. The fact that it dropped off 60% in its third week, I think, is an indicator that uh, word of mouth and the idea that it's going to hang around for a long time, that does not necessarily appear to be the case. Yeah. It looks like it's going to struggle to break $100 million domestically. And uh, there's a little trivial on. Uh, mm. If Birds of Prey, in fact, does not break $100 million domestically, uh, do you know uh, the last live-action DC comics? Mm. There's three. Uh, there's three of them, because they were all in the same year. Right. I, do you I know one them. of the last... Oh, do you see... They're I on see the, them That's there. dumb. They're on the script. So why am I asking you? Like, but you I will know. say, before I looked, <laughs> I, one of them I would have guessed. Which one? I would have guessed Jonah Hex. Jonah Hex did not not, uh, is that one I remember infamous DC Comics yes. tank. In 2010, there were three films that were based on DC Comics that did not crack the $100 million mark. Those were uh, three live-action films. Yes. Those were Red, The Losers, and Jonah Hex. Wow, I never would have come Those up with were the, the last three DC live-action films to not cross $100 million. You also had Teen Titans Go to the Movies, which did not. So uh, this would be the first time in a decade that a live-action film based on a DC comic did not crack that yeah. $100 million mark. And I think the, the first weekend... Domestically. When, right. The first weekend when Birds of Prey came out and it was sort of soft and we were sort of yeah. throwing out a lot of the ideas. Like, that, a lot of those theories now we can see probably were not 
it, or at least we're not the defining factor. Like, right. clearly it wasn't just that people didn't realize Birds of Prey was the Harley Quinn movie, because now they've had three weeks to figure it out. And it's, and still, it's still not. Yeah. You know. That 60% drop is not great. Right. It's not it, a great indicator for how it's going to Exactly. Go. And it's, it's sort of indicative that, well, it's just interest in this movie generally is a little soft. It's, it's not low. that they yes. made some other fundamental marketing mistakes. I think that was the last hope they were clinging on to, is the idea that, you know, people are going to attach this movie and... and Either word of mouth. Word of mouth, the fact that maybe it's going to hold up against competition, right. that does not seem to be the case. Yeah, or that re-emphasizing the marketing campaign just about, it's Harley Quinn, it's yes. the new Harley Quinn adventure, come see Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. I mean, too it little, too seem, late, I think. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have really moved the needle. Uh, there at number four, Bad Boys for Life, still holding over back from January. It's still doing really well. Folks it is approaching uh, $200 million domestically and this actually surprised me I, it, it, I mean I've broken down Will Smith's career before box office wise so I guess it shouldn't have but uh, uh, when Bad Boys for Life passes the 200 million dollar domestic mark it will be the seventh Will Smith film to pass 200 million dollars domestically hmm. I thought there might have been a couple more but there's seven Aladdin Suicide Squad Independence Day I Am Legend Men in Black and Hancock Bad Boys for Life would be number seven on that list. Yeah. So, there Neither you go. of the other Bad Boys films. No. I mean, I'm sure if you adjust for inflation. Right. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and then uh, Brahms, The Boy 2, <laughs> open to a little bit, a little over half of what the feels, predecessor did. It feels backwards to me. Shouldn't it be The Boy 2, colon, Brahms? Well, but, but Brahms was in the first one, so The Boy 2 makes it feel like... I, you can't put the two parts second. I feel like you could do Brahms, colon, from the story, from the, the Chronicles of the Boy. The Chronicles of the Boy. But I don't think you could do Brahms colon the, the boy, boy too. too. I, I object. Yeah. Gotta flip it. You're in a you're in a bit of a pickle there because it's, if you put the boy to Brahms, it's weird because the last one was also about Brahms. So it, it'd yeah. be like saying like you know, Man of Steel 2, Superman. Superman. Yeah, oh, I know. I, the oh, last I one know. was about Man of yes. Steel. how about this? Just the boy too. Or just Brahms. <laughs> Well, you're injecting logic here. Where, uh, I really hate colon the boy too. I don't like it at all. Well, uh, neither did audiences because they gave it a C minus cinema score. Two and boy, two ooh. Brahms. They gave a they gave the boy a B minus. Critics were not kind to the first one. They were even less kind to this one. And as I mentioned, uh, it made just a little over half what its predecessor did in its opening weekend. However, it was made for ten million dollars, which means that it, at the end of the day, it's probably going to make a little bit of money back. I think we have haunted doll fatigue. People are so worried about There's superhero a lot of fatigue. Dolls. I think we've reached peak haunted doll. We're getting there. We need a few years off. Because because they're they're even going into the other Conjuring films. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's like there was like that year in the mid aughts where all of a sudden it was like I can't have any more like soaked Japanese children. Like just yes. Japanese children long, with, wet yeah, hair. with long wet hair or yes. in everything, and we just—it's not that I don't like it anymore. I just need a little breather. A little breather. So and then I'm yeah. ready for people to pull like black hairs out of their mouth when they're sleeping or something. But the grudge, they were not. No, I, I mean, they, they might have salted the earth on that. His on rings the, also, Yeah, nothing. I feel like they really went too far with these soaking wet Japanese children. We went over, we overdosed on that. Yeah. In retrospect, we, we flew too close to the sun. Too much. Uh, just a quick note on last week's non-Sonic releases. They all had not so great second weeks. Fantasy Island dropped 65%. Downhill, which we didn't even mention on last week's show, uh, dropped 69%. Just watch Force Majora. <laughs> Everybody. It's really good. Yeah, and the the, the photograph uh, was in the top five last week. It dropped seventy seven percent. Ouch. Yeah, I think that. I mean, ouch for sure. I think it, like a valent. That was so. It was a big Valentine's, for a Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yeah. And then after Valentine's Day, I think that immediately becomes a. I will wait for that on streaming kind of option. Yeah, you know? that was not a. There was not a whole lot of week two interest in the photograph. So I, mean, I just think it's we we audiences are at the point where just romantic dramas are just not on the itinerary in terms mm -hmm. of things to go see in a theater. It's not that people don't like them; they mm -hmm. obviously still do. I think you is like the most popular Netflix show. I think we made too many pictures about photographs. <laughs> Oh, boy. Not Let's really. I don't know. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, Lon, I mentioned I want to talk a little bit about Fox Disney and the slate that Disney inherited from Fox, yes. how those films have been performing. And the track record has not been stellar. So I whipped up. This is a very rough, and I know you, the spacing geeks are going to get on me. I'm one of them. I tried to get this to line up. Listen, I, 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 I love that you, I always do do I the, you always do the Doc Brown, like, please forgive the crudity of this model. Well, because it's, 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 it's half as bad if I say it going in than if I don't right. say anything, and then it becomes 
problems, everything. So, yeah, we yes, have some chart nerds watching. I, I did not. It's not painted and it's not to scale. But anyway, <laughs> so far, these are the films. Now, these are not the ones that Disney developed. These are the films that Fox uh, had on its slate that were inherited by Disney, meaning right. they were on the release schedule when the deal went through. Uh, and how they've done. So you had Breakthrough, which actually came out the day the deal closed. Yeah. That was, uh, it's just so you're looking, look at the title, look at the release date, it's budget, it's worldwide gross, and then when I say rotten, the RT scores, that is critics and then audience. Right. That uh, was Breakthrough, the, the film that was Oscar nominated for its original song. Best original song. song. And as you can see, you know, made on a budget of 14, worldwide gross of 49, so that turned a bit of a, a bit of a profit. Not yeah. a huge profit, but probably did well on home I think it's one well. of the most successful of that sort of faith-based genre. It's like those, those movies always do well among sort of the niche audience but this one is kind of a breakthrough yeah. there's no i can only imagine but it's not right like, but nah, like yeah there's there. break, breaking through into the mainstream uh then dark phoenix we talked about it that was a, a big flop Ola, as you can see uh, marginally okay with audiences just on the borderline but not a big hit with critics then you had stuber again 16 million dollar budget didn't uh, didn't even double it worldwide so that's a money loser yeah. uh not popular with uh critics uh, somewhat kind of popular with audiences you had the art of racing in the rain 18 million dollar budget 30 million uh 30 31 million almost worldwide. Not a big money maker. Uh, not popular with critics. Popular with audiences, though. Then you had Ad Astra, $90 million budget. $124 million worldwide gross. That's not a good, that's a money loser. Popular with critics, not popular with audiences. I then you get Ford v. Ferrari, popular with both and did pretty well. Yeah. $97.6 million budget, $225.5 million. Big, big boost from all the nominations. Yeah, it got a lot of award season attention. Yeah. Christian Bale out there, Matt Damon out there. Right. That really helped. Them. That's a nice gross. It's, it's It got the Oscar prestige. It was good for the studio. They're not printing money off of that, but it, it did well. Uh, That's then, what you want a movie like that to do. Then you've got Spies in Disguise, open on Christmas Day, $100 million budget, $167 million gross. Popular with somewhat with critics, popular with audiences, but again, you're not printing money with that. As a matter of fact, depending on the marketing spend, you could be losing yeah, money there. I, I feel like for a big holiday family animated comedy, you're hoping you do more than 167. And we'll talk about why that might be. Then yeah. you had Underwater this year, $65 million budget thus far, just under 40, excuse me, million dollars worldwide. Not popular with critics, audiences right on the borderline. That number could go red very soon. And yeah. then we had, as I mentioned, Call of the Wild open this weekend. $125 million budget, to date $40.2 million gross worldwide. That's not just here, that's worldwide where it's open. Uh, somewhat uh, with critics, audiences, pretty warm, pretty warm on it. But as you can see, as far as big money makers, few and far between on this list. And so uh, a lot of people might say, well, it looks like Fox really kind of snookered Disney because this is not a very impressive slate, especially as far as money in, money out. Uh, Ad Astra, very impressive film. Not a moneymaker. No. A very few on that list. And so I wanted to sort of break that down, talk about that, and just say, like, are, you know, were these just bad films? Was it bad marketing? Was it just bad luck? Or might there be more factors behind it? Yeah. Uh, so Dark Phoenix, obviously, and we talked about this, uh, not a great film. Not 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 hugely not popular so. with audiences or critics, but lest we forget, also not popular with Disney. As it came out, there was a lot of reporting uh, that Disney had cut uh, tens of millions of dollars from the film's marketing. The premiere was uh, scaled back. Uh, Disney didn't really have a lot of faith in the film. So, you know, if Disney had put more money into the marketing, would it have made the movie better? No. <laughs> However, Disney did have a hand in that film, probably not doing as well as it could have because it trimmed down the marketing budget and the promotion right. and the glitz and the glamour uh, to to probably about the bare minimum for a movie of that size. And a, and a movie that really could have used the extra boost because audiences were going in knowing end of the franchise, wrapping everything up. It's no longer that you gotta see the next X-Men movie to keep up with what's going on in the X-Universe yeah. because it's over. Well, and then something that I think that Dark Phoenix had, which is going to be a recurring theme as we look at these movies, is inconsistency. Yes. Uh, famously, they put out a trailer, and Fox changed the release date the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it had three different release dates. Uh, that Now, with Dark Phoenix, that was a legacy thing from Fox. That was something that Fox was doing. But as you'll see, this is also something that Disney has been doing even more since the deal closed back in March of last year. We mentioned Spies in Disguise. That movie has been moving 
all over the schedule. Uh, for a lot of people, as you said, a big Christmas release, you might expect more money. Well, part of it may have been that they didn't necessarily know that this was coming out then. First, it was slated for September 13th, 2019, uh, moved from April 19th, 2018, and then uh, moved from that September date into the Christmas uh, uh, season yeah. fairly late in the game. Uh, Disney Disney did a whole slew of, of dates and redates, which we'll look at in a second. So Spies in Disguise, a movie, uh, you know, a couple years in production. Uh, animation is a long production cycle, but even still delayed, so you don't necessarily have the heat of the movie being in production. Yeah. Slated for 2018, and then pushed over a year to 2019, and then pushed from fall to the Christmas holiday season, and that is a big marketing blitz season, and by the way, a lot of competition yeah, uh, you can see how in flux everything is just from this slide you've brought up. Yes. The second paragraph, Fox Award season blue chips will stay put yes. on their release dates. The Woman in the Window on October 4th. That did not come out. We That's will an Amy Adams movie. Yes. Uh, it was supposed to be a big award contender last year. We still have not seen it. And we're going to talk about The Woman in the oh, Window. Because this is, as I, as I mentioned, this is a consistent <laughs> theme uh, with these films. So yeah. Dark Phoenix is moving all around the release schedule. It comes out. Uh, Disney probably recognizes what they have. They pull back on a lot of the marketing funds. It bombs. Spies in Disguise uh, moved to a couple different dates, pushed into a very busy holiday release schedule. It didn't do terribly, but again, it did not have that six months or even nine months to, to really build up to that because right. it's moving around. This was just one slate and and this is one like one date that they did this was back in last may these wow. are all the date changes that disney did to fox these are just the legacy fox films that were already in production they moved art of racing in the rain didn't do incredibly well well that was uh, slated for late september that moved to early august this was back in may so that's a pretty big adjustment you're, you're losing basically two months off of a marketing promotion schedule ad astra that movie was supposed to come out on memorial day now Nobody said what was going on with it, even though it was obvious it wasn't coming out because there had been no promotion. It wasn't redated until September, uh, until uh, very shortly before it was supposed to come out. So that movie's kind of in flux. Then you have Spies in Disguise. That was moved uh, last May, so seven months before it's supposed to come out, it moves from... Uh, September to December, so then you're readjusting that schedule. Then you had Call of the Wild, just came out. That was supposed to come out in Christmas, but Disney moved mm -hmm. Spies in Disguise to where Call of the Wild was supposed to be. Then they moved Call of the Wild to February. Again, this is back in May. You're planning promotions, you're planning publicity, you're planning trailers, etc. Then you sort of pull this out, you go, you move. I'm not saying this is the reason why movies underperform, but this kind of instability makes it difficult to get your, your feet under you. New Mutants, obviously, we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Uh, Death of the Nile, they moved a week. That's not a big deal. And then this poor movie, Nimona. This is an animated yeah. film from Fox. This was given a release date back in June of 2017. It got a February 14th, 2020 release date. As you can see there, Disney pushed the release date at that time on last May uh, to uh, uh, March 5th, 2021. That release date has since been pushed again and is now January 14th, 2022. So the movie, which got a release date back in June 2017. It's going to be five years. It's going to be almost five years if it sticks to that January before it even sees the theater. Again, what does that do to the publicity and the marketing machine? Any buzz that that kind of a project might have had has probably long since dissipated. Yeah. I, I mean, you also just, like, we're in an era now where the audience is so plugged in. And yes. knocking something back repeatedly just sends a message that... We don't know what to do with this. It's not great. We're not right. sure. You know, like, it, it, mentally, I think people register the movies that, wasn't that supposed to come out months right. ago? Where it, is it, it? Depending on when you've seen it or how far into the publicity campaign you've gone, you've seen trailers, you've seen posters, you've seen news yeah. stories and interviews that it's going to come out, then it doesn't come out, so people assume that it did. They forget about right. it. Then you have to re-educate people on it. This is not the sole reason for any of this. No, but no, but I think it does put sort of a... a Stain on some of yes. these projects in the minds of people like, well, it must it must have problems if it's delayed a year. And this is not just something that's happened so far with the movies that have come out that Disney inherited from Fox. This is also going to other films that were on that were on the Fox schedule that still haven't come yeah. out. The first one being The King's Man, which was supposed to come out last weekend. Right. 
that there's some see this, I mean we've been seeing posters, trailers for this trailers came out these were posters that were out Disney yeah. then pushed the Kingsman from February 14th to September so now it is off people's radar now through the summer for months but there's gonna be probably people saying like wait no Wasn't I saw a trailer for yet? that a year ago why is that it's also that not clear that this is tied in with the Kingsman franchise like they need to do a better job of establishing that this is yeah. in the shared Kingsman universe. Right. Because even looking at that poster, you wouldn't necessarily get it. So now you've got marketing uh, work to do for the Kingsman, uh, because now you have to reintroduce people to it in September, leading up to it when it comes out. Also September, uh, it's, uh, depending on how you, you you release it, it could be an okay release window, but it's not February. Uh, it's right. not early in the year when the other Kingsman films, or at least the first one, uh, succeeded really well. And then, Juan, you mentioned uh, The Woman in the Window. This was given a prime, this was an awards contender. Yeah. This was hyped. This was Amy Adams was supposed to get a nom for Her this. Oscar movie, she was going to be great in this. Uh, that that was, as you mentioned, slated to come out in uh, October like, of last yeah, year. Yeah, the height of the awards season. They did they did uh, sc test screenings. I guess Disney wasn't happy with it, so The Woman in the Window now moved to May 15th of 2020. Uh, so potentially still box office could do well, but as far as an awards contender, um, Probably not. As we as we as we've shown on the show, <laughs> yeah. very difficult to, to to get to the end when you have something if, coming out. If, in the if first it's a half very memorable turn from Ms. Adams, and as you mentioned, it's got that bit of. Uh, now it's the movie that didn't work, or they said it didn't I work, or why didn't it come out? It's it, definitely in my head now that that's the movie that was supposed to be a big award contender, and now uh -huh. they don't think it is. So I think the picture that you're seeing, the picture that's emerging, is uh, is the slate of films themselves that Fox had exceptionally strong? No. Uh, however, I think what you're also seeing is uh, very telling about Disney's philosophy when approaching this merger, which is they're not going to be precious about the films that were developed by another studio. No. They they will push them around the schedule. They'll delay their release yeah. uh, with a window of three to six months. They're not really that worried about it, although it's costing them a lot of money. And by a certain yeah. extent, they can also wash their hands of it and say, right. well, it wasn't, I didn't do it. That's what I was just job. about to say is I do think there is a human factor here, which is that when there's something you were working on and developing personally, yes. y you're you're going to be, you're going to want to handle it well. You're going to want it to do well. You're personally invested in it. Yes. Whereas if there's this other project that you inherited from someone else, mm -hmm. well, you know, it, it's almost like it doesn't. It, does it make you look better or worse if it does well? Like, yeah. if if you have a huge success with the project that was developed at another studio by another team, yeah. and it does better than your project, well, now it looks like you don't know what you're doing, whereas if your project does really well and the project you inherited from the other studio tanks, yes. it almost in some ways makes you look smarter. And I think this is a thing that happens in Hollywood all the time, all where the time. a project will be workshopped and then that development executive loses their gig and another executive comes in and they don't want to keep working on all the stuff the other executives had yeah. no matter how good it was no because they didn't come up with it right they want their own branded stuff they've got yeah. to clear it out so i think there's definitely some of that happening and a lot of the disney people are like well we're going to focus on our slate right and the, these other movies that we'll bring out yeah, after whatever, whatever. Yeah, we'll figure yeah, it yeah, out yeah, yeah, and yes we're going to lose money but whatever and, in, right, in the long and, run we're going to make a lot and i don't know if it, it i don't i mean if you even look at the rotten tomato scores like i don't think it's necessarily as much of a commentary on all of these Fox movies. Certainly, it's a mixed bag. Like, yes. I didn't see Spies in Disguise. I don't know. I'm not going to vouch for its quality. But, like, Ford versus Ferrari, Ad Astra, uh, even Underwater, I heard, was pretty good. Like, I don't think it's necessarily, like, these are all bad films. Right. It's just that... You know, when people want to know, like, oh, how does the movie work? How does the business work? I mean, that is such a large part of it yeah. is is this idea of you can be, have a go picture, you're a full steam ahead, you, you're a Call of the Wild adaptation, you're coming out at Christmas, and then there's a change in operation, there's a change in direction, and now you're in February. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. well, that movie wasn't necessarily built to come out in February. Yeah. Like that is more that is feels more like a Christmas movie. But Disney decides, no, they want to put the animated film at Christmas. So now you're off to February. There's right. so many things that are out of your control. And if there's one thing that I think has been thematic so far of the Disney takeover, not just a Fox, but as they put all of their things under one umbrella, it's consolidation. Oh, Even sure. inside the Marvel division, Jeff Loeb is out. No, Kevin Feige is the man. Everything runs through well, him. And Hulu and F. 
effects are getting closer and yes. closer to being just a singular entity. Yeah, yeah it's right. That's the idea. It's, I think when people look back on this uh, transition, when they look at these films, uh, not that they are all necessarily great films, but they are to a certain extent, in my opinion, uh, a, a byproduct, and oftentimes you might even call them a victim of a corporate um, shuffle that made their success uh irrelevant slash immaterial to uh, the company that was supposed to be releasing them. Now, is that bad business? No, not necessarily. I mean, you're going to lose money, but if you don't want to dump $50 million into Dark Phoenix because you, you think it's going to be $50 more million dollars you're going to lose, that's Disney's prerogative. But I think it, again, goes back into the idea of dollars and cents. How do you run a studio? It's not necessarily about quality of film always. It's about whose was it? Where can I put it? Whose yeah. ego? Does it matter? I don't care if it flops because I didn't produce it. That guy did, and he's out of here, and I'm here. I care about my movie doing well. Right. Yeah, if I have a choice between my movie and Stuber, which some other guy made, I'm gonna, You're going to go gonna do your movie. Give so yeah, yeah. Um, I just think it's a really interesting thing, and, and, and it's very rare that you get this kind of a, a lot of times there will be an executive shift, and you'll see a story that will be like, oh, such and such movie was a pet project of you know Walter Hamada or what, whoever right. some former studio chief is. But it's very unusual to have essentially an entire year's slate of films that are orphaned right. that are essentially sent to a new studio uh, with the the studio head and you know definitely the studio have that put that put that slate together gone uh, but also just the idea of like they don't fit into the the, the vision of the industry so right. um, I, I think it's sad for a lot of the people that worked on these films and developed them I think it's interesting from a business perspective so there you go Fox Disney we'll see what happens with the King's man we'll see what happens with the woman in the window I'd love to see Amy Adams win an Oscar She's just, she's been great for a long time. She's been great for a very Master, long time. She's, she's the new Leo. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's look at how movies did around the world outside of North America. Let's look at the top five films internationally. That's everywhere except for North America. Sonic the Hedgehog there at number one. Call of the Wild, as I mentioned, a bit soft uh, uh, outside even of the U.S. Fifteen point four million dollars. Again, they're killing us on the international poster. So much cooler than floating Harrison Ford head. Yeah, I, I think that was an alternate uh, poster, oh, okay. uh, but it's still not not the official one. But I agree, I like that poster much a lot. Better. Uh, then uh, Doolittle. Wow. All edging right. out, and again, this is not great news. That that Doolittle, which opened along a while back, now it's rolling out into different markets, etc. Yeah. But the Doolittle uh, is edged out to Birds of Prey internationally. Uh, uh, that's Birds of Prey there at number four, and then 1917 at number five, bringing in almost another 10 million dollars. We've mentioned it long before. These are very atypical this time of year because we would be seeing a lot of the, uh, the, the Chinese the releases, year. the New Year. Um, but that is that is not. The case, um, which will, we'll, you know, let's look at the top five worldwide and then we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, so these are worldwide. This is the grossest from every market in the world, uh, including North America. Sonic the Hedgehog banks another $65 million almost uh, in its second week worldwide. Call of the Wild, $40.1 million. Uh, again, $125 million budget. It's got to get that gross up if they want to end up turning a profit on that. Uh, Birds of Prey, $16.8 million. Not a great number for yeah. that worldwide. Then Bad Boys for Life, a holdover there. There at number four, 1917, a hold over there at number five. Juan, we have talked about the Chinese market uh, and how that has affected the global box office. That has largely been contained to uh, to China, uh, to that country's infrastructure as far as uh, theaters go, the fact that a lot of the owners are going to be struggling. But we are seeing, sadly, now uh, as this coronavirus uh, crisis uh, spreads, that the effects of this may soon be moving outside of China to be felt uh, globally around the world. Um, we had mentioned Mulan, uh, the fact that uh, it was scheduled for a global release date uh, next month. Yeah. Uh, Deadline reported today that they're now looking at May for at least the Chinese release date. They may still go globally, but Mulan could now be uh, delayed for uh, um, at least a couple months in China. Yeah. That's a, obviously Definitely a big their... market that they were yes. counting on. They need, they need the Chinese people to come. And, the, and they're at the mercy of China as far as when that will be scheduled. It's not up to them. Uh, no Time to Die, the new James Bond film. MGM has announced that the uh, publicity tour and the premiere that was going to happen uh, in uh, China has been called off. No word yet on the release date, but at this point, it's kind of an unspoken thing that everything is up in the air. Nothing is resolved. Uh, the release date for Sonic, which uh, is officially been moved to 
sometime in the future. Again, a very big market, I think, potentially for oh, Sonic. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, so a lot to be written there. And then uh, even today, there's breaking news that there was, the, the moving beyond box office, there was a shoot for Mission Impossible. Yes. The new Mission Impossible movie <clears throat> in Venice. Uh, as the coronavirus uh, spreads around the globe, uh, has now been a, a large, in the last few days or so, uh, a large number of cases that have popped up in Italy. That shoot for Mission Impossible now has been uh, delayed and or canceled. Uh, we are starting to see, and as always, the disclaimer, this is not the important part of the story. Sure. The global health crisis is right. the important part of the story, but the effects uh, on movies, both uh, the production and the and the box office, is now starting to spread. And the what we could start seeing for a lot of these films is not just uh, the the Chinese market, but uh, the European markets, Global and markets, and yeah. and it, and depending on the scale of the crisis, you know, we could very well see it start affecting the domestic markets here in the U.S. Uh, if we start seeing uh, uh, pop-ups here. So, yeah. this is a real-world story uh, in which entertainment is a tiny piece of it, and, and ultimately an unimportant piece, but it could have massive ramifications. Um, in the weeks and yeah. months uh, ahead. It feels like a theme of sort of last week and this week is at first it was the story we were hearing about, you know, anecdotally mm -hmm. that the, the, the disease is spreading, and now we're starting to see some of these ripple effects. Yes. E in economic markets, on the film industry, on, you know, China's infrastructure and local businesses and transportation. And yeah. we're just, in the weeks ahead, we're just going to keep seeing these ripples move out. Uh, and you know more and more impacts of you know you yeah. can't shutting down whole countries has huge ramifications that you may not even feel right away. Well, and and, and yeah, inside the financial story, uh, I was reading that uh, amongst the markets today globally that took a, a large hit, uh, media companies were amongst those that sure. were hit very heavily because yeah. they rely on a consumer base to consume their product, and if they are number one engaged in a very serious uh, health-related issue, obviously the last thing you're probably going to make time to do is to go to the movies or watch Netflix or whatever, but also the fact that, you know, if we see a large-scale shutdown of public places in Europe uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, globally in every continent across the world, obviously that's a massive loss of a consumer base. So uh, this, is, this is a sad story that I wish was uh, contained and over, and we could start talking about the rebuilding, but uh, unfortunately, at least for the next little bit, we're going to be talking about the ramifications of it. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what it looks for as the at the, uh, with the global film market as we start moving into, we're getting into March, April, May, uh, the spring season ramping up to the summer, and we'll see what happens there. So uh, we'll see what happens next week with the worldwide box office. But let's look at what uh, happened here in North America. The top per theater averages. Uh, Emma. We're back to Emma. Oh, yeah. The Jane Austen uh, story. More Emma. Uh, we, had, so we had a big flare-up in the 90s of Emma stories. <laughs> we had Emma and uh, Clueless. Clueless. And now Clueless, we've got yes. another version of Emma starring Anya Taylor-Joy. She's playing Emma. This was the feature debut of Autumn DeWilde. She's a music video veteran. This was uh, the screenwriter, Eleanor Catton's uh, also feature debut as a screenwriter. Very strong reviews. Open in five theaters. Almost 50K per theater for this time of year. Uh, that's pretty good. It's Pretty a, good ever. yeah, this is it's a it's a really good story. It's it's ripe for an adaptation. It's very yeah. despite being a period they was written many years ago, very contemporary. You can riff, you can you can do different Yeah, there's takes also on it's it. interesting because yeah. this this seems like kind of a modern take on Emma, and then we've also got a modern take on David Copperfield coming mm -hmm. out later this year from uh, Armando Iannucci. Every twenty years or so, there's like this uh surge of like we're doing the classics but like yeah but like in this playful like yeah. it's not gonna be so prim and proper we'll, we'll have fun with like, it like i remember the ethan hawk great expectations yes. that came out yes. with uh Warrock. with uh, ellen burston i think uh, yes, I mean, yes, yeah, she's Miss Havisham. Yeah, Miss Havisham, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And then we had the Shakespeare surge of the 90s. Oh, sure. Uh, so, uh, it's look, always, you Classics know. are coming back. Yeah. That's why they're the classics. Let's look at 2020 for, are any of these movies going to be classics? Probably not. But let's look and see <laughs> what the domestic uh, box office looks like for 2020 so far. Bad Boys for Life still number one. Sonic moving up those charts. 
Doolittle there at number three. Birds of Prey just behind at number four with the gentleman there. And then we had three new entries. We had Call of the Wild coming in at number six, Fantasy Island at number nine, The Photograph at number 10. That means we dropped three films out of the 2020 domestic top 10. Underwater spent six weeks. It is now wow. sleeping with the fishes. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, The Turning after four weeks off the wow, chart. I totally and, forgot uh, that existed already. Right? And uh, Gretel and Hansel <laughs> right. after three weeks and now also off the chart. So that's your top 10 for now. That's going to be fluid throughout the year as always. Do you and watch uh, do you watch any of Hunters yet on Amazon? No. Very unique take on the Hansel and Gretel story. I won't blow it. Mm -hmm. They have a very unique take on the Hansel and Gretel story. I have a list of approximately 64 television shows. So I guess I that's number know. 65. I'm not necessarily recommending you jump into this one. It, it uh -huh. is kind of ridiculous, but th there's a whole monologue breaking down the sort of Aryan Nazi esque overtones mm. of Hansel and Gretel that I never thought of. Does before. Pacino do it? It's interesting. It, I wish he did, but oh, he does not. Oh, man. No. There's a witch. No, well, he's doing his he's doing his same uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood voice, oh. his, like old Jew voice. Oh, in okay. Like, oh, maybe Hansel and oh, Gretel. Interesting. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have to see it. I'll, I I'll watch catch 14 it. Fists of McCluskey. McCluskey. I'll, I'll catch it sometime in. 2023. Like the shooting. <laughs> uh, let's look at the 2020 worldwide <laughs> picture. Uh, Bad Boys for Life there. $391 million. Followed by Doolittle. That's broke at 200. Sonic. That's broke at 200. Birds of Prey at 173. Then you've got The Gentleman. Uh, Tanhaji jumps up one. Tolo Tolo drops down one. And then we got Call of the Wild jumping in there at number 10. Displacing the South Korean film. The Man Standing Next down to uh, after four weeks That'd out of the run. list. Uh, South Korean film industry just can't catch a break. Yeah, boy. Uh, not they really their, need not a boost. Not their year. Uh, not, not the year. Not their year. They just need, not they today, need a boost. Parasite coming to uh, Hulu. It'll be a Hulu exclusive. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Do they get Hulu in the White House? Oh, I, I heard hope. the president hasn't seen it. He, yeah, no, he's not, a, not much but of a reader. But he's got some thoughts. Not much of a reader. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I... Love neon, and they're uh, oh man, they're my favorite thing in the world. I've all gone with the wind. He couldn't come up with a better. Film. Well, you know what my bigger thing was. Gone it wasn't necessarily that the that the closest movie he could pull was Gone with the Wind. It's that he then followed up with Sunset Boulevard. Not, Not a, best a best picture, picture winner. winner. No. If you're gonna if you're gonna suggest a classic movie to replace Parasite as the best picture winner, you should at least pick a movie that actually There's won best. So picture. So many great movies to choose from. Yes. Like Caught with the Wind, unpleasant overtones. Well, yeah, but but also. Um, 80 years old. <laughs> I, 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 30s. I, I mean, from the just 30s. pick something from the 70s. Yeah, like his, Patton. His brain is. Stuck. I think he'd like Patton. I'm sure. Right? I'm sure I think would, the president would like Patton. It. I believe he would enjoy it. Patton, even. He, likes, or, he, he, he references Fredo all the time. So obviously, a, obviously a godfather. Godfather, too. Yeah. Like, gone with the wind. I don't know. A I weird choice. That's a strange a weird choice. choice like, yeah, can't we bring back. Gone with the wind, like yeah, God, the Titanic, 80, 80 something. years, something. Yeah, all right, <laughs> Gladiator. Come and on. Gone with the wind, and then a movie that didn't win Best Picture. Oh boy. It sticks and in honestly, my crawl. I'm impressed that he knew Sunset Boulevard. Good for him. As a trivia fan, it sticks in my crawl. Although I have to say that may be one of the only things I agree with the president on. Sunset Boulevard, great movie. Yeah. All should right. Should have won Best Picture. Line before we go, as always, uh, we are going to proceed with our countdown to New Mutants. Very apropos of our discussion today, yeah. because uh, I, I don't think it's it's anywhere uh, past their own possibility that, that this could still not happen. I but. think Disney is watching this show. They yes. know we're counting down to it, and now they're toying with us. They're, That's they're my pissed theory. off at me for yeah. my Captain Marvel and Star Wars reviews, and they're just doing this to screw me. They're going to get it down to one, <laughs> yeah. and then I'm going to celebrate, and then they're going to put it on Hulu. Somehow Brie Larson is behind this. That's all I'm going to say. Was somehow it is behind everything. <laughs> somehow Brie Larson is behind literally yes. everything. She and Kathleen Kennedy. Put that in the thumbnail. Uh, 40 days left. A Linton, we are a Linton season away, launch from the release. <laughs> Start fasting today, and on the last day, you, there will be new mutants uh, in theaters. Maybe. 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 Uh, we are, of course, going to look at that. this week in New Mutants history. <laughs> and Lon, now we're going all the way back to 2017 when wow. the first trailer, the first trailer for the film debuted on Friday, October 13th. I'm sure I watched it 2017. I uh, was busy that day. Uh, October 11th, uh, oh, who can forget this, that same week, Jeremy, the left-coiled snail mm. from the UK, passed away. World-famous snail. Yeah, R.I.P. There was Jeremy. A, there was an a, a, a underground movement to find love for Jeremy, passed away at the age of two. October 12th, Movies yeah. Anywhere. I didn't realize oh, Movies yeah. Anywhere launched uh, the day before yeah, the first trailer for the Mutants came out. 
as I mentioned, October 13th, the debut of uh, New Mutants trailer launched the same day Thor Ragnarok opened in theaters. So think about the fact that New Mutants is not out yet. Yeah. And then think about how long it feels since Thor Ragnarok. <laughs> yeah. And realize that the movie was in production for like a year before that. So theoretically, you could have gone to see Thor Ragnarok in theaters yes. and seen a new Mutants you trailer. You probably did. In front of it. Wow, yes. wow. All Still right. not out. Meanwhile, the MCU, that phase is done. That phase is done. Waititi's already working hard at work on the next Thor The next sequel. Thor movie and was it, released. And he had a movie Sorry. in between. Yes, the next <laughs> Taika Waititi made an entire other film that wasn't Thor Ragnarok, won an Oscar, <laughs> yeah. announced what the next Thor movie was going to be, and is now writing it yeah. before the film that yeah. had a trailer before Thor Ragnarok has come out. Yeesh. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, 2017 doesn't sound like a long time ago. He also ago, made a was. Star Wars show. In he that, also, in that he, oh, yeah, that's right. He also did <laughs> a, Star a little Wars. Star Wars show. Uh, then October 17th, uh, the first 5G mobile connection was mm -hmm. announced by Qualcomm. So that's uh, the end. They're rolling that out now, 5G. Yeah. Well, at and lying to us. Well, yeah, but. 5G E. It's 5G, not 5G is don't, allegedly coming out. Don't and believe then, their uh, lies. October 19th, the Dodgers beat the Cubs to advance to their first World Series since 1988. They have lost that series and I believe another one after that, right? Two? Look who you're talking yes. about. Yes. Two. I'm not going to get another sports <laughs> Please fact Please tell wrong. me so you triple fact check this. this. I didn't. I'm not your last line I'm of defense. I'm 70% on that. sure that the Dodgers have lost two World Series in the time that the New Mutants trailer, that's, since the time that the New Mutants trailer has come out. That sounds right. They do lose those a lot. Well, recently. That. But yes. they hadn't been in one since 1988. Right. It had that whole New World Series sheen on it when the trailer for New Mutants came out. Now. It's it's nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, that's all people wanted to talk about. Then. What's wrong with you, Dodger? This is now a Dodger show. Yeah, bunch of bums. Well, I'll tell you what's wrong is that you have a pitcher like Clayton Kershaw, who's great in the regular season, but it seems yeah, like when he hits the one. they've lost another one. Thank you. But it seems like when he hits the the uh, the postseason, uh, there's like a psychological block, and he's not nearly as good in the postseason. See that, folks? It's not just charts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the limit of my sports We're doing knowledge. rotisserie baseball charts after this. Yeah, I feel like Will Ferrell in uh, old school just like went into a fugue <laughs> state uh, just then. Uh, so yeah, uh, 2017 doesn't seem like that long ago, but just think about the fact sure. that Thor Ragnarok that Blu-ray that's collecting dust on your shelf yeah. hit theaters the same day as the first trailer for New Mutants. Juan, this week hitting theaters, oh, I'm excited about this. Yes. The I Invisible this. Man. Uh, I love the trailers for this movie. Uh, there will be a review for Invisible Man on this channel, this exact channel, Fandom Entertainment, yeah. later this week. Oh, well, there you go. So, uh, yeah, Lee Wanell, Lee he Wanell. did Upgrade, which I think is terrific. He yes. wrote the Saw films. Elizabeth and, Moss. Yeah, good pedigree. I am looking forward to Invisible Man. I hope it's not a letdown. Emma, yeah. which we talked about, is going wide this weekend. Sure. So open a uh, limited release. And then... A lot of times we'll see uh, 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 an anime uh, come out that in limited release that could potentially make some waves box office wise. My Hero Academia, uh, Heroes Rising, which I saw it has two colons uh, from the thing it said. My Hero's Academia colon My Hero Academia colon Heroes colon Rising. One too many colons, yeah, but that's okay. Just Heroes Rising. Why um, can't the heroes just rise? I, I think maybe that it's like a series and then a subset. I'm not even going to get into that. Yeah, After that whole like the arc, like, something the second or the third, right. the second, whatever. Well, there was another one. This is this is not the first My Hero Academia theatrical film. Right. It was one called Two Heroes, I right. believe. Yes. So that was Two Heroes. This one is Heroes. Right. And then they're colon Rising. Well, and there was a Dragon Ball film that broke out uh really uh, strongly last year. Broly. So Broly. Super Broly. Super Broly, right. So uh, we'll see if My Hero Academia can do the same thing in, in a limited release this week. We'll hopefully very, have the numbers for you. I'm very proud of myself for being able to pull you that. You did very well. You did very well, Juan. Very anime knowledgeable. Uh, and, of course, the, the, the carryovers, your Sonics, your Birds of Praise, they're all going to be in theaters this weekend. So of if you course. haven't seen them, uh, check it out. Juan, that's all I got. Uh, anything you want to plug before we go? That's all you got. That's all I got. Uh, Juan, follow me on Twitter, at L-O-N-S. At L-O-N-S. Right. Us. You can find me on Twitter at Merle Dan, and you can find me back here next week, fresh off the plane from Atlanta, where uh, oh, I will be flying yeah. back. I'll be competing this weekend in the, the Schmodown Singles Championship against Ben Bateman. I'm so. informed from television you have to go get lemon pepper wings while you're in town. I was told I had to go get a different kind of chicken. Uh, Danielle said I had to go get hot chicken. 
That's, I'm gonna, that's Nashville, isn't it? That's the hot uh, Apparently, it's great in Atlanta, too. Right. I'm going to go eat all the chicken in Atlanta, and the, I'll tell you which Donald one's Glover the best. The Donald Glover show said lemon pepper wings, and there's a place you're supposed to go. I, 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 okay, well, I'll do I some, only know what TV tells. Next week is going to be charting and wings with Dan. <laughs> I'll let you know all the good chicken uh, wings joints Get in Atlanta. Get some chicken. I think that's what we're I love chicken. It's my favorite meat, and that's a true story. Um, little known fact about me. My favorite meat? Chicken. <laughs> Go back to meats. Yeah, we'll back to meats with Dan. Uh, join us next week and we'll get into pork. Mm, we'll see one. you then. Thanks for watching.